Here's seven tips that no one tells you about make.com. So let's dive in with my favorite one, error handling with a router. Now this allows you to still capture the error. You can see this is still an error pathway, but now we can then choose how we handle that error based on the type of error that we get. For instance, whenever it's a data error, we can ignore it. If it is an error where the ID is missing for this thing that we're trying to look up or create, well, then we could maybe commit the whole um, scenario because we can't continue with all the other steps. Or maybe it's just a server timeout error. Well, in that case, we just want to take a break and then retry that same call in a few seconds or a few minutes. So this allows us to not just rely on this ignore error for every single error we get, we can now get creative and handle different errors for the same module in different ways. And that allows you to build a scenario that's really robust that you can rely on and that doesn't just ignore every error. So my next favorite thing is advanced scheduling. Now here we can set an advanced schedule. We could either set times that we want to run this from. Uh, we could also select specific days that we want to run this. And this could be at using the regular interval um, trigger. We could select, well, I want it to run every hour, but I only want it to run every hour between 9 a.m. and maybe 9 p.m. So I just want that 12 hour window and I maybe only want to run it on weekdays. And on top of that, I might just want to run it on every second month of the year. Right, so you can really get into this advanced scheduling here. And a lot of people just overlook this. Now, if you're using a scenario where you're doing a search of something, maybe you're polling Airtable for changes or polling Google Sheet for something. Well, there's no use polling that every 15 minutes whilst you're sleeping because nothing's happening, right? Unless you have a, a worldwide business where other people on the opposite side of the world are working. You don't need to poll that for 15 hours a day when you're not in the business. So setting this advanced scheduling allows you to greatly reduce your operations used, particularly for polling scenarios. It also allows you to change things so that you can set a scenario to run for a specific month of the year, for instance. You could also set it to run for specific days at specific times or days within a month, for instance. And that allows you to do a lot more custom scheduling. Now, on top of that, we can also set our scenario to run multiple times when it runs. So here we've got the option of setting a maximum number of cycles. So let's imagine that we're doing a call of a Google Sheet. Now that Google Sheet maybe has 5,000 rows, but our scenario times out at the 40 minute mark. And in that 40 minutes, we can only process 500 rows but we need to process all 5,000. And we only wanna do that maybe once every day because it just updates overnight or something like that. Well, what we could do here is we could just simply set a maximum number of cycles. And then now it's gonna process 500 per cycle up to 10 cycles. And if it only needs say five cycles out of the 10 that we've allocated, well, it's just gonna use five operations for those remaining five cycles because all it does is the first step would poll and therefore it would get zero records back. And then we could put a filter here to say only process if there's more than zero records. Next up, we've got the data store. The whole purpose of a data store is to temporarily store data for a scenario. And that allows you to create a custom data structure, for instance. Maybe you want to create a data structure to map data into a QuickBooks line item so that you, you could then dynamically create a list of line items for an invoice. Well, you could do that using the data store. You want to pull in or extract the line item data structure from QuickBooks, load that into your data store here, and that's quite easy. All we need to do is just add a new data store. Then we'd set our data structure and we can use this generate function and then just copy and paste in our JSON into here. And then that will create our data structure. Here's my JSON from QuickBooks and I'm just going to paste that in here. And then you can see it thinks for a little bit and then it maps our exact structure. Now this means that now we can map into our data store. We can set the maximum limit for our data store here. You'll note that it has quite a low limit 
And that's because it's really designed to temporarily store data within a scenario. It's not designed to be used as a complex, full-on database to store all your customer data or sales data. That's not the purpose. If you need that, use Google Sheets or uh, BigQuery or something like that to store the data instead. But here we could dynamically create our invoice. We can add an invoice line. And for this line, we could then map all of our fields. And then at the end of mapping each one of those lines, we could combine them into a, an aggregated list of lines. And then we could simply search and get each one of those lines and then map that across into QuickBooks. So that allows you to do very complex JSON data structuring and manipulation using a data store. You could also use it to store data temporarily. For instance, I use it quite often to store a task ID. Maybe I want to run something in the future. I might want to create an Asana task 30 days after a client signs a project. The data structure just needs to have a couple of IDs to things and then maybe a date field of when it's either created or when we want it to run. And then we set up another scenario to then listen or check the data store for things that are before X date or after X date. For instance, 30 days or more after a creation date, then create the task in Asana and then delete that data store item. And that's just a nice easy way to do those future scenario runs without having to complicate your core data structure. For instance, I don't really want to store this in say Pipedrive or Airtable because it just makes my tables a bit messy. It's really just transitory data. I just use it once. So it's not something I want to have a field for in my data structure. So I can hide it here in, in Make and then just use it every now and then when I need it. Now, the next thing is version control. Now, Make doesn't have a built-in versioning function. They do have a way to temporarily store versions. Every time you hit that save button, it just saves a new version in here. These do expire, so if they're more than 60 days old, they're just going to be removed from the list. That's one way to do versioning, but the better way to do it is to duplicate your scenario and then just call them version 1, version 2. And that's quite simple in Make. You just simply click on the scenario, clone the scenario, and then we can create v2, v3, etc. And you can set them as archived, and you can have as many scenarios as you like in make.com, which means you can have as many versions as you like for your scenarios. Now, the next cool technique that I love about make is being able to set up a custom webhook for any app that I'm using. This allows me to create an instant trigger for anything. I might click a button inside of a custom bubble application. And when that button is clicked, it sends a webhook to this scenario. And this scenario then just simply receives the ID of the thing, and then it will do its logic and send the data back to Bubble. So that allows me to write a very complex, or very simple in this case, logic, and then send data back in based on the chat GPT responses. I use that logic here where I've got a documentation portal for my team, and we click a button after uploading the transcript of a video. That then sends a transcript to this scenario, sends it to chat GPT, and then it writes the title and writes a little procedure from that transcript and pushes it back to Bubble. Nice little system there that is pretty much all automated just from a single button click. You can do the same thing in Airtable by setting up an automation to then send a script with the webhook to make.com and then look up data or trigger a scenario to run. You could also do the same thing in something like Gravity Forms or JotForm by adding in the webhook URL into the settings then you can trigger scenarios to run when a new entry is submitted. Now, this next technique is not really known, and it's called batch processing. Now, you can only use this if your API connection allows for bulk updating or editing or creating of things in a database. For instance, Airtable here has a bulk create or bulk update records module, and that allows us to update multiple records with one API call. And this is really powerful if you have to bulk update hundreds or thousands of records. You can do it in one operation instead of a thousand. So it can save you a huge amount of operations. You will use slightly more data usage, but for 99% of make accounts, the data usage is pretty much never used. And so you've got excess there anyway. 
So how this works is we need to have a source that has an array of items. And in this case, I'm just using the basic trigger and it's gonna have three different bundles within this one step, which is the same as if we had iterated an array and therefore we now have three different items in that array. Same thing here. And then aggregating those items in the array into a new data structure. And this data structure is then looking up the structure from our bulk create records module, our air table module. Or, and now for each one of those items, I'm then creating the structure and mapping the data into that structure. That then allows me to then map the output of that, which is an array, and then send that across into that platform. So now instead of using a thousand here and then a thousand here, so 2000 operations, we're now using three operations. And that can significantly reduce your operation usage in make.com. And the final tip is to really leverage ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT, particularly the 3.5 model, is incredibly cheap. That's what I recommend if you ever need to do regex extraction inside your make.com scenario. It's also great for doing complex JavaScript functions. Uh, for instance, you might want to do a complex calculation. You could pass all that into ChatGPT and the 3.5 model is perfectly capable of doing most of those calculations for you because you're not asking it to create, you're asking it to calculate rather than having 20 or 30 different modules inside your make scenario and then paying maybe 30 operations or more each time that runs. You can combine all of those modules into one call in your ChatGPT call, put all the data in here and you'll get a very reliable result. One thing that I would note is that you should always use the response format of JSON object. And then you want to parse that response as well. And then here you want to put in the structure that you want it to use. So for instance, here I'm extracting the email, therefore I want it to return a JSON structure that looks like this. Now here's our messy bit of text. We could fairly reliably write a regex code to extract this. Your regex is fairly likely to break over time. Whereas this call is very affordable. So you used a total of 63 tokens here and we're using the 3.5 model. So you can see here with our mapping that now we have the result of email. And because I turned on that parse JSON function, it then knows that it needs to parse the result from ChatGPT. It's expecting JSON and then make can then map that into any other module. So that's a simple way to use that, but you could use it in many different ways. You could use it for filtering things rather than creating a lot of different filters in here. You could use this as your filter and then just have the output as true false. And then you just have one condition here of result is true or then continue with the logic. And if not, then do something else. Or you might have the result pick from five different options that you feed into it. And therefore here we'd put a router. So that's advanced segmentation based on the content of maybe a comment that you're feeding into it uh, or the content of an email, for instance. You could set up an email forwarder here where it reads the email, then figures out what department it should go to based on the departments that you've listed. And then you would put into the router here the different departments based on the, the output from ChatGPT and then forward that across to the right person. So you can use ChatGPT to filter, to do regex, to do a whole bunch of things that would normally require a lot of logic to be built out. ChatGPT is a fantastic and powerful tool to do that with.